In this lesson, I'm going to be looking at fascist Italy. Fascist Italy lasts from 1922 to 1943, and then in uh, a truncated form uh, between 1944 and 1945. It has its origins in World War One. And in this lesson, I'm going to be looking at those origins, and then the period up through 1933 when uh, fascism uh, in Italy and <clears throat> in terms of its influence uh, in a lot of the world was uh, at its height. This photograph and the first slide is of Benito Mussolini, who was the dictator of fascist Italy. He was uh, the son of uh, an Italian who uh, had strongly leftist politics. He named his son after the uh, great Mexican revolutionary leader Benito Juarez of the 19th century. And uh, Mussolini grew up uh, adhering to leftist principles. Uh, he was a socialist. He opposed uh, Italian colonialism in Africa. And uh, he became the editor of Avanti, the socialist newspaper, which had a pretty wide readership. He was an important journalist in pre-World uh, War I Italy. And this is important because he uses words very effectively. Uh, in retrospect, he comes off as overly theatrical, almost clownish, uh, particularly in his, his uh, mannerisms. Uh, but if you just look at many of his quotes in isolation, uh, some of them are priceless. They really are. Uh, he had a way with, with words, a uh, very pithy way with words. He could be quite cynical. Uh, but to get a, a window into his mindset, he, uh, he once said, uh, if I have a revolver in, in one hand and a pen in the other, I fear no man. That tells you a lot about him. He uh, was also a bully by nature. And if you look at fascism, uh, to some degree, it really is about that. It's about the bullies uh, taking over and dressing themselves up uh, in, uh, you know, political theory and, you know, trying to make themselves to a degree respectable, but really at, at their core, they're bullies. And he was a bully, whether he was a socialist or a fascist, it didn't really matter. And again, he's a journalist. This is important, you know, you wonder what would happen if a journalist ever took over a country. Uh, you know, if Marat, for instance, had taken over France, uh, before he was assassinated, what would that have been like? Well, you know, it happened in in Italy. A journalist did take over. He switched his views about uh, war and supported intervention in World War One. Ultimately, served in an elite unit, though he uh, uh, was not um, uh, somebody who saw a lot of combat. It was more of a gesture, a political maneuver. Uh, and uh, when the war ended, he saw uh, opportunity politically because Italy had had lost a lot of a lot of men. It had it had uh, uh, thought that it was going to gain a lot of territory in the Paris Peace Conference, uh, and Wilson really thwarted that. They called it the, the mutilated peace, and that's the basis, really, of the fascist movement as a political party in Italy uh, to overturn the, the verdict of the Versailles Treaty. However, Mussolini is not the sort of the spiritual founder of fascism. It's somebody else. The spiritual founder of fascism is the poet and playwright Gabriel D'Annunzio. 
D'Annunzio was a, a major uh, literary figure, public figure in pre-war Europe. Uh, he was as famous in Paris as he was in his uh, native Italy. Uh, he was somebody who was notorious for these passionate affairs that would end dramatically. Uh, during the war, even though he's actually uh, getting on into middle age, he, he volunteers for all these daring assignments. He's in a torpedo boat squadron, and then he uh, serves in the Italian Air Force. And at one point, he's involved in a mission where they drop leaflets over Vienna, demanding the, the surrender of uh, the Austrians to the Italians. Uh, very showy. Uh, he had nerve. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and after the war, he takes a lot of his ideas that were rooted in uh, some of the, some actually some pre-war uh, influences like Nietzsche, the idea of the the Ubermensch, the 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 superior man not being bound by conventional uh, morals and you know social norms. Uh, they needed to break free from that uh, futurism. Uh, that the you know the future belonged to the men who understood machines. Certainly, airplanes were an example of this. Uh, and so, it's this very frothy, toxic brew that he's stirring. And after the war, he leads a group of ex-servicemen and other flotsam and jetsam who were disaffected for various reasons across the border from Italy into the new state of Yugoslavia, which had been uh, awarded the port of Fiume on the Adriatic Sea uh, as a result of the Paris Peace Conference, because the idea was, was that territory should essentially be uh, allocated regarding, uh, with regards to the, the, the majority of people speaking a certain language. And in Fiume, the determination was, was that the majority, and it would have been a slim majority, but a majority spoke Slavic language, not Italian. So there was this very large Italian minority there. And D'Annunzio seizes on this and decides, we're going to, you know, if the Italian government's too weak, you know, this constitutional monarchy, well, we're going to go and just take it. We're men of action. We're ubermensch. So they go and they just take over Fiume. Fiume. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. Think about that. If just a, a bunch of people, you know, uh, I don't know, just got in a bunch of pickup trucks with, you know, guns and, you know, just went into a, a city and said, well, we're in charge now. They don't represent a government. They don't represent anyone, anyone but themselves. Uh, and this is really the basis for what will become fascism. Uh, if you look at a lot of the, the symbols, uh, uh, the theatricality, a lot of it comes from this really weird period in Fiume when D'Annunzio was in charge. It doesn't last. Eventually, both the League of Nations and the Italian government intervene, and he stands down uh, and returns uh, to Italy. Uh, but it does force the issue of Fiume uh, back into consideration in terms of whether that should be Italian territory. So in that sense, he did achieve his objective. But the more important influence is that Mussolini is watching this and he's getting ideas and he's thinking, well, you know, D'Annunzio was not practical enough. He he was not, he didn't understand how politics really worked. He's a, he's a dreamer. He's a poet. Uh, I can do it. I can do it differently. Uh, I'm going to leverage this into political power. What happens is uh, he ultimately will do just that. Now, Mussolini here, and this is a colorized photograph of the uh, famous March on Rome of 1922, which was a march that really wasn't. Uh, it was, again, more theatricality. Mussolini's in the middle there with a sash. Uh, you, you can see some of this already, the, 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 the symbols. So the black shirts that they wear, they adopt the black shirt. So uh, if red is the color of the 
Bolsheviks, uh, who of course, uh, you know, in the late teens and early twenties are um, creating the first communist state and in the process, both inspiring and at the same time, scaring a lot of people uh, in other parts of the world, uh, certainly in Europe, the, the the fascists are going to be the black shirts. And this is a big part of their appeal. Their their argument is we're the antidote to Bolshevism. If you don't want to get taken over by the communists, if you don't want a godless country where the landowners are, are slaughtered by, you know, the the peasants and uh you know where uh uh you know you worked in you know built up your own business and it's gonna be taken over by the state and so forth. Well we know how to handle those those reds, uh, and there were plenty of quote unquote reds in Italy. The so-called red leagues were taking matters into their own hands because the the government, which is a constitutional monarchy, but one that had a very, it was a parliamentary system, but with a lot of parties, it was very difficult for governments to form and last long, to maintain uh, a coalition majority, and they just looked ineffective. And you know, there, there were reds inspired by what was happening in Russia rising up, particularly in the countryside. And so the fascists argue, you know, the black shirts, hey, we know how to, we know how to take care of these guys. We're a lot of, you know, ex-servicemen. We're going to, you know, do in, the, you know, to the Reds what we you know, did in the trenches to the Austrians. Uh, so, you know, back us. Um, and that appeals to the middle class. You're not going to see a lot of middle class people joining up with the black shirts later on many will throw in their lot with fascism when it is in power because it's expedient but in the early stages they're not they're not donning black shirts these are you know basically a bunch of disreputable guys uh, uh but they're disreputable guys who are knocking the heads of the reds who are this sort of scary ogre in the minds of the middle class so they're willing to back them Another thing you'll see, if you look to the, to the right of the photograph, you'll see the outstretched arm of uh, the, one of the black shirts there. It's a fascist salute. This comes from ancient Rome, the, the, the Roman salute. Uh, and this is adopted by the fascists. Now, of course, the fascists, one of the things they play on is, hey, you know, we are the descendants of the glory of Rome. You know, and we need to remember that. We need to be reminded of that. We need to, um, you know, fulfill Italy's uh, great destiny. Uh, you know, Italy was down for a long time and uh, disunited, uh, but now we're going to make the Mediterranean uh, our sea again, uh, Mar Nostrum, uh, as the Romans once called it. So again, it's this bringing back the Roman symbols, and then. Fascism. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll look at a, a, an actual fascist, uh, which is a Roman symbol, uh, in another slide. But again, this is also a reference to ancient Rome. It's a symbol of order, authority, uh, and uh, the you know force if necessary. So that that's really what the argument that is that they make. And uh, the march on Rome is essentially like a bluff. The the, the king uh, is basically you know, on the sidelines here, and he is in a position, if he had had the resolve, to basically order the police and the army to put down the, the black shirts uh, and restore order. But he likes a lot of what they're saying. And he's also not very impressed with particularly the, the more left-leaning parliamentarians. Uh, uh, and so uh he sort of vacillates and uh Mussolini is able to ultimately work with him and that's crucial in the march on rome being successful the march on rome really isn't a march it's a, a number of uh <clears throat> black shirt units converge from different parts of italy uh Mussolini is, really isn't there while it's happening this is just a photo op um he's back in milan his headquarters for most of this uh, but it essentially works he then is in a position to uh, try to form a government uh, and uh, and basically take power. Now it's not absolute power at this point, 
He still has to try to work within the parliamentary system, but he has allies even within the parliamentary system, and conservative politicians uh, who are willing to, to work with the black shirts for the same reason that a lot of middle class people are willing to look the other way when they do nasty things to uh, the, the Reds on the streets. There's one very important figure in this photograph other than Mussolini, and I want to look at him later, but I want to uh, point this out now. So Mussolini is there in the center with, uh, he doesn't have any facial hair, uh, and he's got a sash. To his right, the left in the photograph is a, looks like an older man. He has white, a white goatee, and he's bald. But then to his right, uh, again, moving to the left in the photograph, there's a, the, a very young looking man uh, uh, with sort of a lot of hair and a goatee. Uh, so he's got sort of blue pantaloons on. That is Italo Balbo, who was the uh, fascist leader uh, in Ferrara in northern Italy. He was an ex-serviceman who had served in some pretty intense fighting at the end of the war in 1918. Uh, he opposed communism. Uh, one of his heroes was Garibaldi. Uh, and uh, he throws in his lot. Uh, and he was uh, somebody who was willing to knock heads. And that gets attention and he gets things done uh, and overturns what looked like was going to be a red revolution in his part of Italy. and. Uh, actually makes it uh, uh, safe for uh, the fascists uh, in, in that part of Italy. Uh, so he's going to be one of the main figures, uh, and that's why he's in this photograph. It'll be very important later in terms of how he's able to project fascism's more acceptable, uh, attractive face to the rest of the world. Of course, you have to remember, this is before Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany certainly before the Second World War and the Holocaust and the horrors of places like Auschwitz. And fascism to a lot of people in the 20s and 30s looked like very attractive, not to everybody, um, but to a lot of people. And a lot of people that we would think of as quote unquote respectable people. Uh, you know, we're not talking about fringe, you know, lunatic fringe elements. We're talking about mainstream. So. Mussolini's in power, and the next two years, he's trying to consolidate power within the parliamentary system while also putting pressure on it from the outside. He has his black shirts. Um, they're like an army, you know, and then there's, there's, then there's the regular army. So, like, who's the army? I mean, it's, it's like a, it, it gives him a lot of leverage. One of his biggest critics was the socialist uh, Mattiotti, who was a really dynamic figure and somebody who could rally the left, the center left, against the fascists. And he, was, he, was, you know, he basically called it like it was. And Mussolini didn't like it. Mussolini was, uh, like a lot of bullies, was somebody who couldn't take criticism. You know, he could dish it out, but he couldn't take it. Uh, he hated it um, when people uh, would, uh, you know, in, in any, way, any, way, any way humiliate him. Uh, and Mattiotti was just a thorn in his side. And at one point, he uh, made a comment to the effect that, gosh, I would just wish somebody would just get rid of this guy. Uh, and he was surrounded by his entourage, which he was always surrounded by an entourage. Uh, and certain members of his entourage seemed to have taken him at his word. And they kidnapped him and uh, tortured him and uh, left his decapitated body by the side of the road. This really shook up Italy, because up to that point, the fascists had knocked some heads, but they weren't going after prominent politicians, murdering them, torturing them. And this was taking things to an entirely different level. And Mattiotti wasn't just anybody. And this was the moment when democracy in Italy you know, the, the, the parliamentary government, if it had acted in concert and shown some nerve, Mussolini would have fallen. He was back on his heels. Uh, public opinion was not with him, and he knew it. Uh, and, you know, there's a period there, about a week or so, when if uh, the, and, and also the king has a role to play here as you know, for the father of his nation, 
if he also had uh, shown support that Mussolini probably would have been, his career would have been ended. He would have wound up uh, prosecuted, and, you know, who knows, maybe in jail and would have wound up just being a fringe figure. But they don't, they, 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 they can't get over their polarization. Uh, they, they, they lack the nerve, the resolve, and mostly realizes, oh, wow, I'm not gonna get thrown out of power. And then he finds his nerve and essentially uses the Mattiotti crisis as the springboard to absolute power. To basically say, you know, look, um, I'm gonna call the shots here uh, and uh, uh, everybody needs to uh, follow. And this is gonna be the end of parliamentary government as we've known it because it's weak and ineffective and fascism is strong and it's, it's, it's the future. Um, and so they're gonna build a fascist dictatorship that's quasi totalitarian. There's, some historians have discussed a lot about fascist Italy. Was it totalitarian? Was it not? You know, again, this theatrical, almost circus aspect to Mussolini makes it seem like totalitarian light, particularly when you compare it to, say, Stalin's Russia or certainly Hitler's Germany. It, it just doesn't. It just doesn't ring true that it's totalitarian. However. If you lived in Italy at that time, particularly if you were a socialist or a communist or a union activist, I mean, it was totalitarian enough. Um, it was it was it was not um, a place where uh, people's rights were respected and uh, where the press was 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 uh, given press freedom. The, really, the only counter to fascism throughout the 20s and into the 30s was the was the church catholic church which of course has deep roots in italy uh the king was a willing accomplice uh so mattiotti's death which could again could he could have been his death could have had meaning in the sense that it could have led to the the downfall of Mussolini. it doesn't it shows that uh people have got to be willing to to act together and, and uh, have resolve, or you wind up with someone like Mussolini. So what happens pretty shortly after this? Uh, Salute al Duce, right? The, the greeting, the, the hail to the Duce. He takes the title the Duce, the leader. And he starts wearing uniforms. Uh, this is interesting because up to that point, he would, you know, when he was in, in Parliament, such he would wear a suit, and he was a politician in a suit. And occasionally, even after this, he would wear a suit, only occasionally. But he starts wearing uniforms. And he actually had quite a, quite a nice set of uniforms. And of course, Italians, you know, in terms of the, their fashion industry, really, you know, it's the the non plus ultra. So he had some really nice uniforms. I mean, uh, that he would strut around in. But, I mean, stop and think about that. I mean, what's up with that? This guy's not, he's not a general or anything. He did serve for a brief time in World War I, but, um, so it's kind of weird. I mean, I, I can just imagine the, the you know, Italian citizens, apparently, at least initially, when he first started wearing uniforms, being like, you know, given a double take, like, what's going on here? You know, imagine if President Trump uh, tomorrow started wearing uniforms, right? He's not a military guy. He, he he doesn't, I mean, even if he did, even if, even if he had been right, you, the president you have to be a civilian. You have to be out of uniform. That would be really jarring, you know. Uh, it would be like it would be really weird. I can't imagine that. Um, uh, I, don't, I imagine I don't think anyone could imagine that. Um, but that's what happened with Mussolini. He starts wearing all these uniforms. So it shows the militaristic side of, of fascism. This idea that sort of. If you're not conquering, then you're going backwards. This is that influence of social Darwinism from the 19th century that drove imperialism. In some ways, Mussolini sort of picks up the baton from Kaiser Wilhelm, who also loved uniforms, right? They, they're, they're sort of very similar in some ways in terms of their modus operandi. Also, if you see, he's got the, his chin and nose, you know, sort of upwardly pointed towards, that is a stylized fascist symbol 
which is the symbol of fascism, which again has ancient roots. So it's a cult of personality. Mussolini basically is everyone, he, he's every everything to everyone. He's He's, he's an artist, a scientist, a military leader, a diplomat, a, a playboy. Italians love to have their leaders, you know, driving uh, fast cars, you know, with beautiful women seated beside them. And Mussolini was all too willing to oblige. Um, he would leave his light on at his office in, in Rome. So people would think he was up there working all night when he was nowhere near the place. Um, so they build up this, this thing. He's, he's more than just... Um, the leader of the country politically, he's this uh, sort of demigod, a political demigod. And there were lots of slogans, but this is the one that I think really nails it. But essentially, Mussolini is always right. This was, this was taught particularly to children. Uh, you just, you know, Mussolini is always right. Anything he says is right, even if he contradicts himself then he's still right. That's the logic. Of course, there isn't logic. This is the embrace of unreason. This is something that we've seen already. Uh, if you look at uh, Boulangism in France in the 1880s, General Boulanger, uh, it's the same kind of mentality. You have this figure that everybody you know, looks up to, and I mean not everybody, but you know, the, the followers look up to, and they're always right. Again, even if it doesn't even make any sense, sometimes what they're saying, uh, that's fascism. Indoctrination, you get hold of the youth, you put them in uniforms, right here, they're giving the fascist salute. Um, uh, boys and also young girls were indoctrinated early on with things like Mussolini is always right. There is a counter to this in Italy, and it's the church. The church is ultimately going to make a deal. I'll get to this in a moment with Mussolini, and they'll have their own youth organizations, which to a certain degree are a counter to that. That's, that kind of thing would have been unimaginable in Nazi Germany. There's no way Hitler would have allowed it. Again, this idea is, was fascist Italy really totalitarian. You know? But indoctrination is definitely part of it. Uh, and you can see this here. Get hold of the youth brainwash them. And so, so here's an actual uh, drawing of a fascist. So you have an axe and then you have a bundle of sticks around the axe. And these, these were um, carried by uh, uh, Roman political leaders, symbols of their authority. The axe is the power and the force if necessary. And then the bound sticks are unity, the unity of, of the people. So you see this symbol all over the place in fascist Italy, sometimes stylized, but if you know what to look for, you'll see it everywhere. Here is this uh, deal that's done, the Lateran Treaty in Concordat of 1929. Uh, if you look, you'll see Mussolini looking uh, more sort of uh, statesman-like in a, a suit. Uh, um, of course, the, the Catholic Church off to his right, uh, they look a little bit, uh, well, looks like, you know, well, we, we're, we've made the deal. Um, I don't think they had any illusions really about what Mussolini was, but this allows for the church and the Italian state, the secular Italian state to move on. Mussolini was an atheist, actually. He didn't believe in religion. He, he, he inherited that. Um, from a young age, uh, but he sees it as expedient, similar in some ways to Napoleon, uh, who reached a deal with the Pope uh, in the 19th century uh, to move on over this conflict between the secular state and the, the church. And, um, you know, that is an accomplishment because, you know, the, the, the Italian state that unified in 1871, well, going back to 1860, but really the, the final piece was in 1871 when they established their capital in Rome, had been declared antichrist by the, the Catholic Church. And of course, most Italians were at least nominally Catholic, so it was a very awkward situation. And Mussolini was able to get 
uh, the, the Italian secular state beyond that, the church was willing to work with him. So in some ways, the church is an enabler of Mussolini. And when you start looking at a lot of the things, particularly that start happening later, when Mussolini starts imbibing some of this anti-Semitic uh, stuff from Hitler, and ultimately what that would mean, um, it really discredits uh, the church. But that that's uh, at a later period. Here's the old Balbo again. I want to finish with him. So Balbo, um, he was interested in in flight, and in flight, he didn't serve as a pilot in in World War One. Um, but mo both he and Mussolini are interested in flight. Uh, Mussolini survives actually a, a wreck at one point, and ultimately um, he uh, stops uh, his pursuit uh, of uh, becoming a pilot. But Balbo uh, was persistent and eventually became a, a fairly competent pilot. And his reward for his service to the fascist cause was to be given control of the Aeronautica, the Italian Air Force. And he decides to make the Italian Air Force into a showpiece for uh, what Italians could do and, uh, and essentially for fascism, fascist efficiency, modernism. The, the building that he had built, the new, new headquarters of the Aeronautica in Rome, it's still there. And it's a very elegant. Uh, art Deco structure um, and a lot of attention to detail um, that emphasizes efficiency, modernism, professionalism. Uh, and he essentially embraces the idea instead of the solo heroic pilot in the, in the, in the mode, for instance, most famously of Charles Lindbergh, who was the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic from, from New York to France, he decides that what he wants to do is he wants to have essentially a coordinated group of a squadron of planes that would do similar things to these large air voyages, essentially to prove that uh, intercontinental travel, uh, air travel would eventually become something that would be um, safe, uh, be in the hands of professionals, not adventurers. And, and it's well, that's not fair to Lindbergh, because Lindbergh certainly, he, he, he was the adventurer in him, but Lindbergh certainly was a professional too. But anyway, um, and they use the flying boat model, these beautiful uh, Savoia Marchetti flying boats. This was before the idea of airports with, uh, you know, runways had f become sort of fixed in people's minds as, as, as the, the, the logical way that air travel would happen. Um, the Italians feel that what you could do is have some ports and then uh, you know, safe harbors where these uh, gigantic seaplanes would then put down. And so, and then in the 30s, that you know, there, there's both of these sort of modes eventually become commercialized. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So Balbo ultimately leads these uh, these flying boat squadrons on three uh, really epic journeys. One to the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, which was quite a controversial move, fascist uh, Italy sending uh, its most talented pilots on this daring mission to the Soviet Union, uh, but it's sort of extending a hand uh, to the Russia. Then the first transatlantic cruise, first down the coast of Africa and then jumping off and crossing the Atlantic to Brazil, where the Brazilians are thrilled by the sight of these gleaming white flying boats over uh, cities like uh, uh, Bahia and, and Rio. Uh, and uh, they're greeted there as, as heroes, particularly by the Italian immigrant community. And then they return. But the most ambitious was planned for 1933. Mussolini and Balbo. Uh, I'm not sure what they're discussing here, but uh, the men on either side of them seem to find it amusing. Uh, Mussolini found Balbo a very useful tool because Balbo had charisma. He liked people. Uh, he did not have the, he didn't come off as arrogant and clownish as Mussolini did to a lot of foreigners. Uh, so if he wanted to present fascism's face to the world as something that was, again, attractive um, and that people wanted to emulate, 
you could not have found a better ambassador than than Balbo. He just had this uh, charisma. Um, and of course, what he was doing couldn't be denied in terms of the accomplishment. It was really remarkable uh, what they were doing with these flying boat squadrons. It caught the world's attention. But Mussolini is a little bit jealous, and that jealousy ultimately grows. Uh, uh, Balbo will finish his career actually as a colonial governor in Africa, uh, sort of forgotten uh, uh, because Mussolini uh, feels that he's taking a bit of the, uh, actually a lot of the spotlight away from him. But that's later. Here's a photograph of uh, Balbo in his uh, air minister's uniform conversing with the Lindberghs uh, and Merle Lindbergh and her husband, Charles Lindbergh, who was one of the most famous people of the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s. Uh, Lindbergh really was a very competent, uh, brave professional. Uh, you cannot uh, diminish his achievements. However, he's going to become, uh, and it's interesting, a lot of pilots in this golden age of aviation were sort of drawn to fascism. And some ultimately embrace it, some just sort of dance with it and never really embrace it. But Lindbergh later on is associated with the America First movement, which um, felt that the United States should stay out of World War II. And of course, if that had happened, uh, there's a good chance Hitler would have won the war and that would have changed history in clearly a negative, very negative way. Um, and so again, Lindbergh and Balbo, they're both, you know, Balbo's a fascist. But Lindbergh, again, certainly he he's, you know, He's comfortable around fascists um, and certainly around a pilot, somebody who had the same kind of vision that he did in Balbo. He respected him. Uh, but it's a, there's this sort of, again, this sort of troubling undercurrent of fascism and aviation in the golden age of aviation. And Lindbergh, uh, I mean, he, he actually visited Nazi Germany and he was uh, treated um, uh, as a, you know, a, a great international figure, do all honors and so forth. Um, so this photograph is sort of, is indicative of, of this. So the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago, it's one of the most famous World's Fairs that's ever been held. It stands out for a number of reasons, most importantly, because it was the first World's Fair that looked forward, so futurism, we talked about this early on, as opposed to looking at backward at sort of this idealized neoclassical architecture, architectural past, uh, you know, the Beaux-Arts style, which you would have seen at the, the actually the first World's Fair in, Ch in Chicago in 1893, or the famous uh, World's Fairs in Paris, for instance, or in Buffalo. Um, this is like, this is no, this is, we're looking forward, not backward. And in many ways, you know, the Chicago Fair is kind of like the future that never happened. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the the old animated television series, The Jetsons, but it was sort of, you know, you could see where the Jetsons got a lot of their ideas if you look at the pavilions and displays and such at the Chicago World's Fair. And aviation plays a central role. Look at this poster promoting it, right? You've got uh, Zeppelin, um, you've got aircraft and, and so forth, right? Um, sort of there's a, there's a moon off there, so it's sort of implying maybe outer space. Um, that's the, really the, the main thrust. And, and so they invite these famous aviators, and none more fa famous than Balbo, who's going to fly his squadron across the Atlantic, very daring, across the North Atlantic, um, uh, and then sort of hop from Canada. They, they stop in Montreal, um, where they're greeted as heroes, and then they come to Chicago and land with great precision on Lake Michigan. Everybody who ever saw it, uh, never forgot it. The, the, the beautiful precision on this beautiful summer's day on Lake Michigan. And of course, they had flown over the city prior to that. Think about what people are going to be thinking about 10 years later, or not even 10 years later, when you hear planes, engines flying in formation overhead of a, you know, a city. What's the next thing, you know? You know bombs fall. Uh, so it has a very different the context. When you look at it in a larger context, it's, it's sort of jarring. And a poster showing the flying boats, 
uh, talking about 1933, and that Roman numeral 11 means the 11th year of the fascist era. Photographing one of these beautiful flying boats. They'd have the Italian colors on the tail, but then if you look um, towards the front of the plane, you see the fascist symbol. And the pilots would wear black shirts underneath their flight suits. Here's one of the planes coming into land at Lake Michigan in 1933. Uh, Balbo was given a huge welcome. This was probably the, the, the biggest uh, public welcome and uh, parade for anyone ever in Chicago history. The city just went wild, not just Italian Americans, but everybody. Um, with the exception of socialists, Italian socialists uh, were handing out leaflets condemning Balboa as a fascist. Um, I guess Ferris Bueller probably had, you know, if you think about the the the, the scene uh, where he sings to his friend Cameron, I guess that might be the, a bigger parade. But other than that, Attila Balboa had the biggest. Planes, big planes in formation, flying over a city. That's gonna have a vastly different meaning soon in European history. World history, Madrid, Shanghai, Barcelona, Warsaw, Rotterdam, London, Leningrad, Hamburg, Dresden, Tokyo, Hiroshima. These are Balbo's flying planes over our city, New York. This was the final stop uh, before they went back to Italy, and he was welcomed again as a hero. Spoke at a huge fascist, and sort of a sort of a combination fascist Italian American rally. It was sort of both of the things going on at the same time um, uh, at at the at the, the garden. Um, tens of thousands of people, rapturous applause. New York City. Here he is um, being seen off. This is our city, New York City. And look at these people giving the fascist salute to Balbo, framed by the American flags. He's there in his white aeronautica uniform. It's pretty jarring. It's hard to believe, you know, that right here in New York City, in the United States of America, you have people giving the fascist salute. Uh, but again, the context was different. Balbo was a very attractive figure to a lot of people. His achievements and those of his fellow pilots were pretty remarkable and worth celebrating, strictly from an aviation standpoint. And again, this is, you know, by the summer of 1933, Hitler is in power in Germany, but it's just the beginning of that. Um, and World War II and the Holocaust are off in the future. And for what it's worth, Balbo was not an anti-Semite when Mussolini adopted or started copying uh, Hitler's anti-Semitism. Balbo was having none of it. Um, at one point, he was required to host a dinner for the, the German uh, head of the Air Force, Hermann Goering, Nazi, uh, in Africa. And uh, he put on a big uh, dinner, but he made a point of inviting the most prominent Jewish uh, members of the community uh, in the city, I think it was Tripoli, um, and made a point of introducing them to Garing to make Garing uncomfortable. So Balbo never embraced that. That said, he did a lot of thuggish things um, uh, in the lead up to the March on Rome. Uh, and, uh, you know, keep in mind what I said about bullies. At, it, at its core, that's really what fascism is about. It's it's about enabling bullies. Uh, so I hope that that was uh, informative. Uh, and uh, in the next uh, the next lesson uh, in European history, I, I want to look at the the rise of Adolf Hitler, who was a keen observer of what was happening in Italy. He saw Mussolini in the black shirts as 
as role models. Uh, so uh, it's important to keep that in mind, uh, given the consequences of uh, what will happen in Germany. So until next time, Salut.